Oh, thanks for coming back to the story place again. Well, I've got something interesting uh, today. I've got uh, two stories that based in the Cameroon and another one in South Africa, and then a story uh, and about a, uh, two urban families that um, are affected by a, a riot and a fire and how they, how they get to know each other because of that you know, terrible situation. So this, uh, this book here, Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters, is, um, is based in South Africa. A long time ago, in a certain place in Africa, a small village lay across a river and half a day's journey from a city where a great king lived. A man named Mufaro lived in this village with, with his two daughters, who were called Manyara and Niasha. Everyone agreed that Manyara and Niasha were very beautiful. Manyara was almost always in a bad temper. She teased her sister whenever their father's back was turned, and she had been heard to say, someday, Niasha, I will be a queen and you will be a servant in my household. If that should come to pass, Niasha responded, I will be pleased to serve you. But why do you say such things? You're clever and strong and beautiful. Why are you so unhappy? Because everyone talks about how kind you are, and they praise everything you do, Maniera replied. I'm certain that father loves you best, <laughs> but when I am a queen, everyone will know that your silly kindness is only weakness. Nayasha was sad that Manyara felt this way, but she ignored her sister's words and went about her chores. Nayasha kept a small plot of land on which she grew millet, sunflowers, yams, and vegetables. Yams are a staple uh, in, in the African diet, um, in Nigeria as well as in South Africa. They're, it's, it's kind of like a sweet potato, but I guess it has a slightly different flavor and a different shape, but very close. She always sang as she worked, and some said it was her singing that made her crops grow more bountiful than anyone else's. One day, Nyasha noticed a small garden snake resting beneath a yam vine. Good day, little Nyoka, she called to him. You are welcome here. You will keep away any creatures who might spoil my vegetables. She bent forward, gave the little snake a loving pat on the head, and then returned to her work. From that day on, Nyoka was always at Nyasha's side when she tended her garden. It was said that she sang all the more sweetly when he was there. Mufaro knew nothing of how Manyara treated Nyasha. Nyasha was too considerate of her father's feelings to complain, and Manyara was always careful to both behave herself when Mufaro was around. Early one morning, a messenger from the city arrived. The great king wanted a wife. It said, the most worthy and beautiful daughters in the land are invited to appear before the king, and he will choose one to become queen, the messenger proclaimed. Now, you may remember if you've been coming to, this, to the um, story place that um, in other countries, non-Western countries, in the Middle East, in Africa, uh, India, that girls aren't always allowed to choose their husbands. And they are often married when they're very young. So it's something that appears to us just very unacceptable, but that's the way those, those cultures have been for thousands of years and still are. Mufaro called Manyara and Nyasha to him. It would be a great honor to have one of you chosen, he said. Prepare yourselves to journey to the city. I will call together all of our friends to make a wedding party. We will leave tomorrow as the sun rises. But my father, Manyara said sweetly, it would be painful for either of us to leave you, even to be wife to the king. I know Nyasha would grieve to death if she were parted from you. I am strong. Send me to the city and let poor Nyasha be happy here with you. Mufaro beamed with pride. The king has asked for the most worthy and the most beautiful. No, no, Manyara, I cannot send you alone. Only a king can choose between two such worthy daughters. Both of you must go. And so you see, you see in this picture here, you see the two personalities of the sisters. 
and again on this next page. That night when everyone was asleep, Manyara stole quietly out of the village. She had never been in the forest at night before and she was frightened, but her greed to be the first to appear before the king drove her on. In her hurry, she almost stumbled over a small boy who suddenly appeared standing in the path. Please, said the boy, I am hungry. Will you give me something to eat? I've brought only enough for myself, Manyara replied. But please, said the boy, I am so very hungry. Out of my way, boy. Tomorrow I will become your queen. How dare you stand in my path? After traveling for what seemed to be a great distance, Manyara came to a small clearing. There, silhouetted against the moonlight, was an old woman seated on a large stone. Um, you know, there are a certain number of stories that, are, that cross cultural lines and languages, and they're sort of... Um, they're, they're sort of they're folk tales, but they they adapt themselves to different cultures. But it's quite often that an old woman appears who has magical powers. That was in one of the other stories uh, that I read to you. There was an old woman that appeared, I think, in more than one of the stories. And here's another one. The old woman spoke. I will give you some advice, Manyara. Soon after you pass the place where two paths cross, you will see a grove of trees. <clears throat> They will laugh at you, but you must not laugh in return. Later, you will meet a man with his head under his arm. You must be polite to him. How do you know my name? How dare you advise your future queen? Stand aside, you ugly old woman, Manyara scolded, and then rushed on her way without looking back. Just as the old woman had foretold, Manyara came to a grove of trees, and they did indeed seem to be laughing at her. I must be calm, Manyara thought. I will not be frightened. She looked up at the trees and laughed out loud. I laugh at you trees, she shouted, and she hurried on. It was not yet dawn when Manyara heard the sound of rushing water. The river must be up ahead, she thought. The great city is just on the other side. But there on the rise, she saw a man with his head tucked under his arm. Manyara, <clears throat> Manyara ran past him without speaking. A queen acknowledges only those who please her, she said to herself. I will be queen, I will be queen, she chanted as she hurried on toward the city. Nyasha woke at the first light of dawn. As she put on her finest garments, she thought how her life might be changed forever beyond this day. I'd much prefer to live here, she admitted to herself. I'd hate to leave this village and never see my father or sing to little Nyoka again. Her thoughts were interrupted by loud shouts and a commotion from the wedding party assembled outside. Manyara, mis <clears throat> Manyara was missing. Everyone bustled about searching and calling for her. When they found her footprints on the path that led to the city, they decided to go on as planned. As the wedding party moved through the forest, Brightly plumed birds darted about in the cool green shadows beneath the trees. Though anxious about her sister, Nyasha was soon filled with excitement about all there was to see. They were deep in the forest when she saw the small boy standing by the side of the path. Well, you must be hungry, she said, and handed him a yam she had brought for her lunch. The boy smiled and disappeared as quietly as he had come. Later, as they were approaching the place where the two paths crossed, the old woman appeared and silently pointed the way to the city. Nyasha thanked her and gave her a small pouch filled with sunflower seeds. The sun was high in the sky when the party came to the grove of towering trees. The uppermost branches seemed to bow down to Nyasha as she passed beneath them. At last, someone announced that they were near their destination. Nyasha ran ahead and topped the rise before the others could catch up with her. She stood transfixed at, the first, at her first sight of the city. Oh, my father, she called. A great spirit must, guard, must stand guard here. Just look at what lies before us. I, I never in all my life dreamed there could be anything so beautiful. Arm in arm, Nyasha and her father descended the hill, crossed the river, and approached the city gate.
Just as they entered through the great doors, the air was rent by piercing cries, and Manyara ran wildly out of a chamber at the center of the enclosure. When she saw Nyasha, she fell upon her, sobbing, do not go to the king, my sister. Oh, please, father, do not let her go, she cried hysterically. There's a great monster there, a snake with five heads. He, he said that he knew all my faults and that I displeased him. Well, he would have swallowed me alive if I had not run. Oh, my sister, please do not go inside that place. It frightened Nyasha to see her sister so upset, but leaving her father to comfort Manyara, she bravely made her way to the chamber and opened the door. On the seat of the great chief's stool lay the little garden snake. Nyasha laughed with relief and joy. My little friend, she exclaimed, it is such a pleasure to see you, but why are you here? I am the king, Nyoka replied. And there, before Nyasha's eyes, the garden snake changed shape. I am the king. I am also the hungry boy with whom you shared a yam in the forest and the old woman to whom you made a gift of sunflower seeds. But you know me best as Nyoka, because I have been all of these. I know you to be the most worthy and most beautiful daughter in the land. It would make me very happy if you would be my wife. And there he is, very handsome. And there we see, I guess this must be the wedding here on the next page, because they seem to be all dressed up and blowing horns and drums and so forth. So that's another feature of um, folk tales is transformation. Um, you think of the, um, the frog that became a prince when, when he was kissed. So that, that's another common feature in some of these tales. And now, another story from Africa. This is called Sense Pass King, which is a, a dialect word in English. There you see an angry old man with a pipe and there is Sense Pass King, the little, the little girl. That's her, that's her nickname. One day a messenger came to the kingdom. And again, this is a, again a sim, kind of a similar, similar story in a lot of ways. A powerful emperor in a faraway country wishes to give his daughter in marriage to the suitor he finds most worthy, he said. The king was overjoyed. A marriage to the emperor's daughter would increase his wealth and influence, he decided. He prepared to journey to the emperor's court. The king took 10 of his most trusted soldiers and Ma'anta to cook for them. That's the one who has the nickname of Sense Past King because she was, had more sense than the king. The party traveled for three days and three nights across the ocean. The emperor greeted the king and his company. He called for his daughter, Tataya, to come and meet the strangers. Although she was still a child, she was already as beautiful as the evening star. The king was pleased at the thought of marrying this lovely creature. Your Excellency, he addressed, he addressed the emperor, I assure you that I will take care for your, I will care for your daughter as I would a precious jewel. So, so the king thinks he's the one that's going to marry her. Perhaps, replied the emperor, but she's still a child. It will be years before she's ready for marriage. If you think you can care for her, prove it to me. Ever since birth, Tataya has had a very poor appetite. If you want to take my daughter, prove that you will make her eat properly. The king ordered Manta to prepare a delicious meal for Tataya. She cooked rice and chicken, meat, soup, cakes, and vegetables. She gathered mangoes and bananas and coconuts and peanuts. When the meal was ready, the king called for Tataya. See all the delicious food I've prepared for you? The king asked the little girl. Go ahead and eat. But Tataya only shrugged. I'm not hungry, she said. Tataya, wait, called Manta. I want to show you something. Manta untied a string of bells from around her waist and began to play a song. When Tataya heard the bells, she was delighted and started to play with them. She opened her mouth in laughter and Manta quickly popped in a small piece of mango. The little princess was so happy with the bells, she chewed and swallowed without thinking about it. Then, since past king, that's Manta, fed her a piece of chicken, all the while continuing the game with the bells. 
In this way, Tataya soon finished the meal. The emperor smiled at Manta. You are a very clever young woman. I entrust my daughter to your care. The enraged king held up his machete to kill Sense Pass King then and there. Wait, your majesty, she whispered to him. Don't shame yourself before the emperor. Remember, I live in the palace with you. Everything I own is yours, even the little princess. When Tatai is old enough, she'll marry you just as you planned. The king saw the truth in Manta's words. He agreed to let Manta bring the little girl home. As they left the emperor's lands, all was calm. But as soon as they were out to sea, the ship was almost capsized by an enormous wave. From behind the wave, a horrible sea lizard rose. He was bigger than a baobab tree and had seven heads. Each of his, each of his seven mouths sprouted fire and steam. Where is the princess? The monster thundered. Give me the princess. The soldiers tried to shoot the monster, but their arrows bounced off his thick scales. Shoot his eyes, cried Sense Pass King. But the dreadful creature terrified the men so that their hands shook, and most of the arrows missed. Soon there was only one arrow left, but the monster still had four heads. What shall we do? The soldiers asked their king. Just give him the princess, he cried, shaking with fear. We have to save ourselves. Sense past king couldn't let that happen. Hand me your bow, she ordered the soldier with one last arrow. I can kill him. The king spat at her. You? What can you do? But the soldier handed the bow to Sense past king. Standing in front of the sea lizard with the bow hidden behind her, Sense Pass King suddenly began to scream, Oh no, oh no, 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 first you came in, and now you've brought your brother too. What will happen to us now? When the monster heard this, he was very surprised. He thought he was the only one <clears throat> of his kind, so he, he was fooled. He looked left and right, his head swiveling in every direction, trying to catch a glimpse of his brother. Don't, don't you see him, cried Sense Pass King, pointing to the right. He's over there, even bigger than you. Oh, no, oh, no. The monster craned all four of his remaining heads in the direction Sense Pass King pointed. As soon as his eyes were looking in the same direction, Manta raised her bow and aimed. Her single arrow passed through all his eight eyes. With flames bellowing from his dreadful mouths, the monster sank to the bottom of the sea. It's pretty graphic. The travelers returned to the seven villages with the beautiful Tataya. All the people came out to welcome them and hear the story of her journey. The king told everyone he had won the child for his bride and had rescued the ship from the terrible sea lizard. But his soldiers, disgusted by his cowardice and dishonesty, told the people the truth that they owed their lives to the bravery and wi wisdom of Sense Pass King. So that is how Sense Pass King lost her name. When the people heard the true story, they drove the king from the palace and away from the seven villages. They made Manta their queen. Queen Manta ru ruled wisely and well. She sh taught Titaya how to speak the language of the animals. The little princess befriended the wild creatures of the forest who often came to visit the palace. The people of the seven villages lived in peace and prosperity for all the years of Manta's reign. Now this story is called Smoky Night. It's a, it's a tale from um, an urban city that unfolds during a riot and a house, an apartment building that was set on fire. And it tells us something about um, fairness and uh, ac acceptance of people who aren't like us. Mama and I stand well back from our window looking down. I'm holding Jasmine, my cat. We don't have our lights on, though it's almost dark. People are rioting in the street below. Mama explains about rioting. It can happen when people get angry. They want to smash and destroy. They don't care any more about what's right and what's wrong. Below us, they are smashing everything, windows, cars, street lights. They look angry. But they look happy too, I whisper. After a while, it's like a game, Mama says. 
Two boys are carrying a TV from Morton's Appliances. It's hard for them because the TV is so heavy. Now, I just should tell you that this was written in 1994 when the TVs were completely different. They had a big bulge at the back of them and a lot of, um, a lot of electronics inside. So that's why they had trouble carrying the TV. Are they stealing it? I ask. Mama nods. Someone breaks the window of fashion shoes. The two women and a man climb in through the broken glass. They toss out shoes like they're throwing footballs. I've never heard anybody laugh the way they laugh. Smoke drifts, light as fog. I see a distant flicker of flames. Across the street from us, people are dragging cartons of cereal and sacks of rice, pardon me, from Kim's Market. My mama and I don't go to in Mrs. Kim's Market, even though it's close. Mama says it's better if we buy from our own people. Well, that's not a good thing to say to your child, is it? I mean, it, it breeds dis, distrust. Mrs. Kim's cat and my cat fight all the time, and Mrs. Kim yells at Jasmine in words I can't understand. She's yelling the same kind of words now at the people who are stealing her stuff. They pay no attention. I move behind Mama. Will they come here? There's nothing for them here, Danielle. See? They finished with our street. They're moving on. Our street is emptying. One last man is staggering under a pile of clothes he's taken from the dry cleaners. The plastic bags are still over them. But the next thing I know, Mama is shaking me. Quick, Daniel, get up. There's a terrible smell of smoke. Someone's pounding on our apartment door. Fire, fire. I'm suddenly awake. Where, where's Jasmine? I run to the closet. Sometimes Jasmine sleeps on a shelf. Mama's screaming at me. We can't wait. Jasmine's gone. Put on your shoes. Hurry. We rush down the stairs. Others crowd around us. The smoke makes me cough. Mr. Ramirez is in front of us carrying um, Lissa and the baby, who are both howling. Those people are hooligans, he shouts over his shoulder. Hooligans. Mrs. Ramirez is ahead of him. She's holding the cage with Loco, their parrot. Loco squawking something awful. Did you see Jasmine, Mr. Ramirez? I shout. He shakes his head, but I don't think he even hears me. Don't touch the railing. It's hot. Outside, the sky is hazy orange. Flames pounce up the sides of our building. Three fire engines scream to a stop. Firefighters jump out, running, pulling hoses. I see our window where Mama and I had stood. The fire hasn't reached it yet. Is everybody out? One fireman yells. Far as we know, another says. D did you see a cat? I ask him. She's yellow. Maybe she's still in there. He glances down. Probably not, son. Cats are plenty smart. <laughs> She'll be long gone. A lady comes up to us. There's a shelter you can come to, she says. Everyone follow me. I'm crying because I'm not sure Jasmine is all that smart. What if she's still inside? Some of the street lights have been smashed. We walk along the sidewalk with sparkles with broken glass. There are empty cartons everywhere. A street sign lies crumpled in the gutter. I grab hold of Mama because I think I see a dead man with no arms lying there too. But it's just one of those plastic people that shows off clothes in department stores. The lady looks back at Mrs. Kim, who is trailing along behind us. Are you all right? She calls. Mrs. Kim nods. We're almost at the shelter, the lady tells her. The shelter is in a church hall. There are cots to sleep on and a table with hot drinks. Two men are making sandwiches. We see people from our building. They're talking about who did this. What will happen to us? It's a sad, sad night, Mr. Jackson says. I ask him about Jasmine. He says he's pretty sure he saw her. She got out, Daniel, he tells me. I hope she's not just trying to, I hope he's not just trying to make me feel better. Did you see my cat, Mrs. Kim asks. He is orange. He's the color of carrots, I say, and I almost add, and he's fat and mean, but I don't. A girl gives me a mug of hot chocolate. I wish it had more sugar. When I finish drinking it, Mama says I should lie down. She's always making me lie down. People keep coming. Some are crying. One woman screams and screams. I hide under my blanket. Then Mama says, Danielle, look. 
And there is the firefighter who was at our building. He's standing in the open door with a smoky knife behind him. And I see that he's carrying a cat under each arm. That was how Mr. Ramirez carried Lissa and the baby. The cats are howling too. Jasmine, the blanket's caught on my foot and I'm trailing it. Oh, thank you, thank you for finding her. The other cat is mine, Mrs. Kim takes her big, fat, mean, old orange cat and holds him close. I'm kissing Jasmine. She smells of smoke. Where was she? I asked the firefighter. The two of them were under the stairs, yowling and screeching, he says. He takes a mug of hot chocolate. I like him so much. I wish I had a whole barrel of sugar for his drink. The cats were together, Mrs. Ms. King, Kim asks. The firefighter nods. They were so scared, they were holding paws. I grin, no, they weren't. What about our building, Mr. Ramirez asks. The fire's out. You'll be able to go back in a day or two. A woman puts down a dish of milk. Here, kitty, kitty, she calls. Jasmine jumps out of my arms, and Mrs. Kim puts her carrot-colored cat down, too. The cats drink from the same dish. And milk isn't that good for cats, but I don't say that either. Look at that. Mama is all amazed. I thought those two didn't like each other. They probably didn't know each other before, I explained. Now they do. Everyone looks at me and it's suddenly very quiet. Did I say something wrong? I whispered to Mama. No, Danielle. Mama's tucking at her fingers the way she does when she's nervous. M my name is Gina, she tells Mrs. Kim. Um, perhaps when things settle down, you and your cat will come over and share a dish of milk with us. I think that's pretty funny, but nobody laughs. Mrs. Kim picks up her cat and strokes him. She's staring at the wall, but maybe she's not, maybe she's not going to say anything. But then she looks across at Mama. Thank you, she says. We will come. Mama smiles. I reach out and stroke Mrs. Kim's big old orange cat, too. Can you hear him, Mrs. Kim? I ask. He's purring. And that's the end of the story. So the cats brought the two families together because I guess among cats there's no, uh, no racial or cultural issues. Well, thanks very much for visiting the story place again. We'll be, there'll be more stories to come. Thanks for watching. I'm Anne Ann Marie Battistone, and I'm at the Norfolk the Norfolk Cable Studio here in Norfolk, Massachusetts. Bye-bye, we'll see you again.